What's poppin' y'all? It's your boy Pee Wee the Plug, and in today's video, I'm giving y'all my top five sleepers of the 2022 NBA draft. One thing I do want to make clear before we get this video started, my draft sleepers are a lot different from the sleepers that I see um, on draft Twitter or in a lot of different draft spaces. Um, I truly do not believe that a prospect is a sleeper if he's everybody's sleeper. If you're everybody's sleeper, or if everybody has the same sleeper, that means that that prospect is no longer slept on. Everybody's aware of his talent um, and abilities. So like last year, I remember a lot of people had Bones Highland. And I'm like, bro, I'm going on every draft uh, platform. I'm reading all of these draft articles, all of these draft interviews and, and uh, podcasts. And everybody's giving the same answer. This year... It's Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. When everybody becomes aware of a prospect, um, just because he's not a top 10 prospect does not make him a sleeper. Everybody is aware, then I, I just, I can't get with that movement. So a lot of my guys, majority of my guys, are guys who are projected to go from the second round or even undrafted. I have real sleepers on my list. I just wanted to make that clear for anybody who was going to be in the comments like, you forgot this guy or what about that guy? I'm fully aware of probably every prospect in this draft class. I just think that my ideology of what a draft sleeper is, is a lot different from everybody else, but that's just me. But to dive into the list, the first guy that I have um, in no particular order is Jabari Walker from Colorado University, the son of Samaji Walker, um, the former Laker. Jabari is a one of a kind on the defensive side of the basketball, extremely versatile defender, covers a lot of ground with his 6'9 size. Um, I think he's the exact type of wing defensively that a lot of teams in the NBA are looking for. Um, a guy that can guard two through four, handles his own on the block, uh, can even keep up with some guards in those certain instances. Um, in today's game where defenses are extremely switchable, he's the type of Swiss Army knife that you're looking for on the defensive side of the basketball. Love the way that he uses his size and his length, contesting shots through pick and rolls or screening. Um, he's extremely versatile and valuable on that end um, of the basketball floor. On the opposite side of the floor, I think he'll be even more valuable in an NBA offense versus college. I think college had him doing a lot of things that his game isn't predicated to doing, and it put him in a lot of bad situations. He's not an ISO scorer. He's not a guy who should be trying to create a shot for himself um, in any instance. Does a lot of uh, spinning like Pascal Siakam, plays a little bit too aggressive, and I don't like his touch around the rim. I think at the next level, an NBA offense is going to have his role a little bit more simplified. I think he strives as a catch-and-shoot guy in corners, loves the top of the key, can even be a trail shooter. Um, and I think a lot of NBA teams will put him in those situations to make his role just strictly three and D. And I think in certain type of offenses where you see the Mavericks, how it's centered around Luka and you have a bunch of role players who guard on the opposite side of the floor and they come down, they stay out of Luka's way. Luka collapses defense and he's able to shoot it. I mean, pass it out to shooters like Reggie Bullock, Dorian Finney-Smith and those other type of guys. You put Jabari Walker in that same type of role. And I think he'll thrive. I literally compare him uh, to Dorian Finney-Smith, a guy who's going to be low maintenance on the offensive side of the basketball, but is respectable as a shooter and will help you space the floor for your star offensive players. And then on the opposite side of the basketball, he's going to do a lot of the dirty work, rebounding, guarding guys from all over the place. Um, and I think with a second round projection to undrafted, he is the type of guy that all of the teams um, in the NBA are looking for that'll be low maintenance, um, and the second round to undrafted, those are the guys that we look back in four or five years, like a Dorian Finney Smith, who don't eat away at your salary cap. Most of the time, if you can find a three and D guy in the second round, you're going to be able to keep him around for a very long time, um, and, and use your salary cap to go get the high end offensive talent. So Jabari Walker is a guy that I definitely um, we'll be looking for in the second round if I'm any of these NBA teams. He is the type of defensive 3 and D guy that every team is currently looking for in the NBA. Jabari Walker. Um, next, Max Christie. Uh, shout out to Max Christie. He's from around the way. Works out with my little brother EJ all the time. Him and his brother. Uh, shout out to the Christie brothers. But Max Christie, my second guy on this list. 19-year-old uh, guy. 6'5 uh, shooting guard from Michigan State University. 
he is a guy who disappointed a little bit as far as percentages go as a shooter. I still classify Max as a knockdown shooter. Uh, I think once you become a knockdown shooter and have that reputation, percentages don't uh, make you who you are. You are who you are, and he is a knockdown shooter. I'm buying all the stock in him um, as a floor spacer and a guy who can play off the ball in the backcourt with a ball-dominant guard. Um, I think he showed a lot at Michigan State being able to shoot it off the right, shoot it coming going left shooting off flare screening curls uh when he's ran off the line he has the ability to have the one dribble mid-range pull up shoots it good at the free throw line um has to work on his handle but i think that's the opposite side uh of his upside is is his full offensive profile i think he has some extreme potential to be able to put the ball on the floor create some shots for himself uh playing a pick and roll that's a side that we didn't really get to see as much and i think if that can expand with nba development um i think he'll be an extremely high value offensive secondary option for a team um on the opposite side of the basketball is where he impressed me a lot i had no idea that max was going to come in and defend the way that he did he plays with his feet and his chest, which is good habits to see on the defensive side of the basketball uh, for a young guy like Max. A lot of guys come in and they real handsy and they, you know, get in foul trouble. Max uses his size, his length, and his chest uh, to wall up a lot of guys. And he played Big Ten basketball, which is a lot of NBA talent he's going up against in that conference. Um, one thing that I will say is his frame is a little smaller, so I could see him out the gate struggle with the bigger wings like the Paul Georges, the Kawhis, the Jason Tatums. They could definitely outmuscle him with his size. But with NBA training and um, you know, conditioning and weightlifting, if he can add about 15 to 20 pounds of muscle over the next couple of years with his extreme upside on the offensive side of the basketball as a floor spacer and a catch and shoot threat with the development and potential of being an on-ball secondary creator out of the pick and roll or however you want to put him in uh, whatever situation you want to put him in. I think he's extremely valuable. And I think he could even be drafted in a late first round. I would not be surprised if a team brought him in for a workout, saw his shooting ability, and if he maybe displayed a thing or two on the offensive side of the basketball that he maybe wasn't able to show in his freshman year at Michigan State, I can definitely see a team falling in love with him at the end of the first round and using that pick to just take a chance on a guy who has two-way upside uh, with an offensive profile that is extremely, extremely high at his age. So Max Christie is definitely a guy to watch for uh, late first round, second round. The third guy on my list is Julian Champagne out of St. John's University, 6869 Dual Ford. Uh, guy is just an absolute shot maker from the perimeter, from the mid range, mid post, fadeaways, step backs, catch and shoot, pick and pop, flaring, screening. Any type of shot on the basketball court, Julian Champagne can make. And the one thing about him is that he makes them contested. Reminds me a lot of Marcus Morris with the type of shots he takes and the type of shots that he makes. Over the last couple of years at St. John's, I love the growth of learning how to use that shot making as leverage to begin, I mean, to progress into a good off the ball score, whether it's back doors, back cuts for easy dunks and lobs and things like that. Um, on the defensive side of the basketball, I think he has good size, not move, you know, not easily moved on the block, uses his length in the passing lanes, quick active hands, got a lot of steals uh, with front court pressure for St. John's, really takes advantage of lazy passes. Um, definitely got to be a little quicker with his feet uh, to keep up with the quicker guards and quicker wings. He's, he's a dual forward, um, so you know some of those guys may be a little too quick, so he has to learn how to use his length um, and that perspective to keep up with those guys on the perimeter. Uh, one of the other things about him that he has to work on is like Marcus Moores can kind of get tunnel vision. There's a lot of times with St. John's because of the score that he is, uh, he makes defenses collapse or he gets, generates a lot of attention. And I think he misses a lot of easy kickouts and dump downs to teammates. Um, and hopefully in the NBA system, those things will be able to get fixed. Um, and then he settles a lot because he's not a guy that's generating a lot of separation. He doesn't have quick bursts. He's not beating anybody off the dribble or anything like that. He tends to take a lot of pull up mid range jumpers because guys can recover and cut him off from driving fully to the basket. So with a little better shot diet, um, a little bit more awareness with the kickouts um, and some quicker feet on the perimeter, I think Julian Champagne, he can fit in any NBA team and definitely be a, a second unit guy who we can see progress as a 
high-end starter like Marcus Morris. I think Marcus Morris and TJ Warren are two very great comparisons for him uh, from the play style and the potential trajectory he can have in his NBA career. Julian Champagne, one of my personal favorites. I just love guys who can make tough shots, and he does that with ease. Um, next for me is Isaiah Mobley out of USC, the 6'10" stretch four this dude can shoot the ball lights out from corners as a trail man didn't have too many looks as a pick and pop shooter at college at usc but i definitely think that there's potential there as a pick and pop shooter and then the playmaking um play made for as a pick and roll guy as a ball handler a 610 four was i saw it <laughs> in in usc footage he was in the pick and roll not as the screener as the ball handler and was making plays can make plays from the mid post um, I saw him get chased off the line and make plays going downhill as an attacker. He has a very unique play style and game for his 6'10", power four, small ball center frame. Same thing on the defensive side of the basketball. Very comfortable switching, playing against the perimeter, can hold his own one-on-one -on -one, um, at the perimeter. The one thing about him, though, he's not a rim protector. Uh, for his size, he doesn't play as big as you would like. Or you would hope. And that's why for me, one of my comparisons for him is Maxi Kleber, just because of the comfort defending the perimeter and the switching ability, but the lack of rim protection. So I think if you're a team draft and you want to probably pair him with somebody who's already a rim protector, like Clint Capella, Rudy Gobert, anybody who you can put behind him and allow him to roam and be able to switch with the rest of your defensive unit puts him in a position to succeed. Um, again, because of the unique play style, 6'10", playing like a guard. That translate in other areas that may frustrate coaches um, or fans where he doesn't use his size to the best of his ability. He floats the ball up um, on the interior like a guard using a floater instead of going into guys, drop stepping and dunking. He's not he's not a guy that's playing as physical as he possibly could with a 6'10 frame. Um, so those are the kind of the frustrations that you could deal with. Um, even though the unique part of his game you may love, there's pros and cons to it. But I think in the right situation, Isaiah Mobley is just a guy that I think plays winning basketball in the right system. I, it's, a, it's a handful of teams that could use this type of basketball player. Um, Minnesota, Sacramento, the Pacers, uh, a Swiss Army Knight 4 who was comfortable shooting and spacing the floor from corners, trail, pick and pop all over the perimeter, who can also play make switch on a perimeter, hold his own down low on the block, just not a rim protector. I think there is some extremely uh, high value uh, attributes with Isaiah Mobley. And if he goes undrafted, I think there's going to be a long list of teams trying to sign him to a two-way deal, a G League deal, whatever, for him to make their roster uh, come opening night. I like Isaiah Mobley. I think he's a winning basketball player. Uh, next for me is Jordan Hall out of St. Joe's. Uh, six seven wing point four whatever you want to call him I think he has some of the highest IQ of anybody in his draft class at the point guard position or out of pick and roll extremely patient love his pace with his size there's not a pass on a basketball court that he can't make live dribble passes with either hand live passes cross court passes highly accurate highly sharp bullet pass or hall of fame for my 2k players um with that being said though i love the growth he's had as a shooter especially a catch and shoot threat because i think that's the role he may be playing at the next level out of the corner showed a lot a lot of growth there um definitely is making teams pay more when they go under on the pick and roll and he's very crafty in that mid-range area the only thing about jordan is he's not the most explosive and quick uh as quickest player with his feet so on the defensive end, he plays a little too upright, which allows guards, quick guards, to go past him with blow-bys. Uh, his closeouts aren't the best. The guys go right around him there. And then because he lacks the lateral quickness, he doesn't recover well defensively. So I see a lot of Kyle Anderson comparisons there. But because he doesn't have the 6'9 size and length that Kyle Anderson has, I don't think that that's as accurate because defensively, if you put him on the right team, he could probably be a good team defender. But Kyle Anderson is a better defender because of the size makes up for his lateral quickness. 
I don't know if that's likely for Jordan Hall. I see him as a guy that can be like a Joel Ingles, a secondary playmaker who can space the floor when he doesn't have the basketball. And again, with the right tools and the right setting for him um, on the defensive side of the basketball, he may be a good team defender, but I don't know if he's ever going to be the defender that Kyle Anderson is just because the, la the lateral quickness isn't there and he doesn't have that size. But with his high IQ, his pick and roll play, his accurate passing and the ability to make any pass on the floor, plus being able to space the floor as a catch and shoot threat. I think that there's a role for him at the next level. Um, and the second round pick is super, super safe to take on a guy like him with experience. He should be able to come in and be ready to play from day one. And he's versatile. Put him at the point guard, shooting guard, small forward. Um, and depending on who you're playing, you make it even play on some power for a minute. So Jordan Hall is definitely a name to watch for. And then last but not least, my honorable mention. I know I said at five, but I have an honorable mention. Keon Ellis out of Alabama. I love Nate Oates and Alabama players. Keon Ellis is another one that I like. Uh, when it comes to lateral quickness, he is second to none. He can keep up with anybody on the perimeter. 6'6", um, six, six, extreme size, suffocates guards, and then uses that size well to not allow them to really breathe and get shots off easily. Plays really well in transition from playing at Alabama. I love his quick release. Another good catch and shoot corner three point guy um, is an extremely good cutter. Not a guy that you're going to put the ball in his hands and have him create for himself. Doesn't have the best uh, creation or separation. Don't really like his pull up um, and his frame. For him to be 6'6", I think it is very important that he guards guards. Because he's 6'6", like Max Christie, he has that thin frame that he can get pushed around and bullied a lot with the bigger forwards and wings um, of the league. The only difference is he's a lot older than Max Christie, so I don't know if he's going to be able to put on the weight or you know the, the strength and conditioning program will have as much of an impact there. He's probably grown into his body. Um, as much as we'll see, but a very high active defender who can give guards a lot of trouble and then play um, in a system where he can play without the basketball, catch and shoot in corners. Reminds me a lot of Josh Richardson and then Terrence Mann from the Clippers. I really like the Terrence Mann comparison um, when, I, when I put those two together. Keon Ellis um, is going to be a wrap as my last NBA draft sleeper. Uh, let me know in the comments who y'all have as sleepers. I like all of these guys. Um, I've, I look for, for me, my sleepers and what went into picking who is my sleepers is, a, is just very, very subtle skills. Um, and it's three things, guys who can either pass, shoot, or defend. I'm looking for guys who have a combination of these three things, whether it's the passing and shooting, whether it's the shooting and defending, whether it's passing and defending, you have to have at least two out of the three of these things. Very rarely in the second round or in the undrafted territory where you get a guy who can hit all three. Those guys are usually lottery picks who can pass, shoot, and defend. So when you get to the second round, if you can find guys that have two out of these three things, I think it makes sense for them to be able to fit into NBA programs and systems. And all of these guys on my list can either pass, defend, or shoot. And you might have a guy like Isaiah Mobley who can do all three with a few you know weaknesses here and there so that's how i made my decision on my sleepers um and and, and the fit at the next level in the comments let me know who y'all sleepers are and if there's anybody y'all think i miss or anything that y'all like about these guys that i named let me know mock draft coming extremely soon i know a lot of y'all waiting on that um until next time though i'm Wee the plug and i'm out peace